Toastmasters from District 73, and I'd really love for Mohammed to be given the biggest round of applause from today. So please welcome Mohammed Katani. I didn't even know what that was. 
And I'm reading the emails. Timo. Timo. What a cool name for a rapper. Oh my god, they want to rap. Finally, my dream is coming true. I got so excited, ladies and gentlemen, I started walking with my album. You know, so So the next meeting comes, and I'm ready to meet Mr. Timo, you know? And I took the stand and he yelled, yeah. I got shot by a hater. He was a traitor. He wasn't even my evaluator.
than the clock? 18 minutes. <laughs> I signal everything. Green, red, yellow. <laughs> Never lose your focus. You see, we chase dreams in our lives. It sometimes don't grow. We might get distracted by something that most of the time is meaningless. And we chase that also. And then we wonder how come I didn't achieve the big goal of my life that I set years ago. Because you allow yourself to be distracted. Never lose your focus. Another goal? Another reset. <laughs> meeting you become the grammarian. What does it do? Well, you note the English used in the club and you introduce the word of the day. What is that? Well, it's a new word that people might actually use. You know what? I have just a word. No. <laughs> the end is silent. <laughs> he asked, what's that? I said, well, it's a, it's a type of dinosaurs. <laughs> How are people going to use that? I don't know. <laughs> I love classical details. He said, no, you need to pick a word that people could actually use. Uh, you know what? I got No, 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 tell me what it is. You <laughs> see. <laughs> so the meeting comes, they introduce me to introduce the word of the day. I said, ladies and gentlemen, the word of the day is.
Those ones they ask me to announce the winner. I said, the best speaker is. It's Jane. And the first one they said, Jane didn't give a speech. <laughs> success is to know what is your weakness. And don't be ashamed to know what it is. And don't be ashamed to admit it. My weakness when it comes to speaking is I'm not a good writer. I suck at writing. So in order for me to make it all the way to the top, I took my speech to a lot of people and said, please help. And when you ask people to help, you'll be surprised how many people will step in to help you. But nobody's going to help you if you don't admit what is your weakness. I call Slim Anthony. He changes numbers. <laughs> I track him down and said, please, just give me one last chance. I don't know if this master is good for you. He doesn't like it. Maybe you should do like bird watching or something. I don't know. No, just give me one last chance. I want to give a speech. Really? <laughs> yes, I want to give my ice cream. Mm -hmm. Alright. So I wrote the speech. I tried to make it as funny as possible. I go on stage, I gave my ice cream, but they loved it. I won the best speaker that day. Mm -hmm. The new year after, I gave my second speech. Filled with humor. They loved it. I won the best speaker that day. <laughs> and third and fourth and fifth speech, and I kept winning the best speaker in every meeting. And that's when you realize what is your strength. We talked about finding out what is your weakness. Also, know what is your strength. I found out that I can make people laugh easily. So when you know your strength, capitalize on it. Use it. And if somebody wants to give you advice on something that you're strong at, say, thank you, I got that coming. However, <laughs> I'm weak in other areas. Could you help? And I started speaking and I loved it. And one day the president came to me and said, Muhammad, have you thought of doing the speech contest? What's that? Well, every year there's a contest in table topics, evaluation, humor, and international. And I think you have a knack for humor. You should do the humor speech contest. All right, don't do it. So I wrote the speech and I entered the contest. Club level, boom, I won. A level, boom, I won. Division level, boom, I got second. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, I'm a bit of a... I'm a sore loser, you know? <laughs> May I have a bottle of water? I'm not going to finish. <laughs> so, I sat at the back of the hall <coughs> with my second place trophy. Just hating myself.
thought about it for a minute. I said, well, I want to speak to 1,000 people. If I get the chance to stand in front of 1,000 people and deliver a message, for me, that was success. Is. And he smiled. And he said, if that's really what you're after, one day, I don't know when, but one day, you'll make it all the way to the finals of the International Space Contest. And you can speak thousands. Then he gave me a piece of paper and a pen. Keep in mind, this is 2010. He gave it to me and he goes, write your acceptance speech. I said, for what? He said, the acceptance speech that you're going to say when you win the World Championship. <laughs> it's so crazy. He said, no, no. <coughs> write it. Because when you write it, you believe it. And when you believe it, God will make it happen. See, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we say to ourselves, one day I'll get there. And when you say it with that kind of belief, you will get there. I don't know how long it takes you, but it will get there. But if you say, I'm just going to try. Trying is like you're giving yourself an excuse to quit when things get a little bit difficult. So I wrote an acceptance speech, and I kept it in my pocket. And I completed every year since then. Even though I lost a lot of times, but you know. <laughs> So aim for something higher than a materialistic piece of glass or a trophy or whatever. 2012, I was doing my advanced communicator bronze and I was doing the manual of the entertaining speaker. How many of you have done that manual? So in that manual, there's a speech called the dramatic talk. Now in the dramatic talk, you're supposed to give a dramatic talk. <laughs> so I wrote my speech, I'm ready, I'm standing in front of my club, and I start to give the speech, and people were laughing. Mm -hmm. Things that they're not supposed to laugh at. <laughs> kept on going, and they kept on laughing. And I'm thinking, why are they laughing? This is not supposed to be funny. This is a dramatic talk. I finished my speech, and then I went to talk to my president, and I asked, why were people laughing? And she goes, well, you know, because you know, I'm a Qatar, you know, you're the funny guy. Excuse me? Yeah, you're the funny guy. You make us laugh. That's when I realized that I became the clown. <laughs> See, don't get me wrong, I love to make people laugh. But when you cross that line and people don't take you seriously, it hurts. And I hated those messages. And I really wanted to quit. And I stopped from going to the club for a while. Because I thought, this is it. This is my time to quit. And then she called me and she said, why are you not coming to me anymore? I said, I don't want people to think I'm the clown. She said, then break the stereotypes. Show them that you're not the clown. And that's when I started writing my international speech contest. I didn't complete until two years later, but if from that day on, I stopped doing humor speeches in my club. Because you need to break the stereotype, even if it's a good one. If I ask you all, what do you know about David? And you guys said, well, he's a great leader, all right? What else? I don't know. <laughs> then he's already been late. He is a great leader. And yesterday, we found out he's a wonderful speaker as well. And I was surprised as you right now. <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> but my point is, you should be a person of so many surprises. You should be a person that not everybody says, I did not see that in for her. Don't be labeled. Even if it's a good label, you should be a person of so many tricks and traits. 2013, I was the club president. Why did I become the president? <laughs> Nobody was running. <laughs> And I noticed that ever since I became the president, people stopped coming to the meeting. <laughs> and every meeting, the attendance is getting lower and lower. I wanted to give up. I called my air director, my division director, I said, this club is struggling, and I, I, I really don't think I can keep it alive. I said, just give it more time, just push it a little harder, and if you reach to a point where you absolutely think this club is going to die, don't worry, we'll close it. <laughs> then one meeting, one club meeting, I went there, and there were only three of us. I was a Toastmaster today, I gave a speech and evaluated myself. <laughs> <laughs> but we still 
ran the meeting, but at the end, I was looking at that empty hall. I said to myself, my God, I failed as a president. I failed as a leader. I hate this. I went to my office, opened my email, and started writing an email to my editor director and my division director. Guys, this is Mohammed Kapani, the president of North Park Post Masters Club. You guys know that the club has been struggling for the past few months. I've tried everything to save it, but nothing works. And I think I failed as a president. I actually don't want to be a Toastmaster anymore. So please, support this club. And I want to tell you that I'm renowned in my membership. I don't want to do this anymore. I wrote that email. I was about to hit him. My phone rings. I pick up the phone, and this lovely lady, her name is Madame Neri. She was one of the few people in the meeting. And she goes, Mohammed, whatever you're about to do, please don't do it. <laughs> Where are you? She said, I had a feeling that you're going to do something. Whatever you're about to do, please don't do it. I said, Ma, you saw the meeting today. Three people. There's no hope out of this. I cannot keep this club alive. She asked me, do you think this is the worst that could happen to the club? I said, I don't think it can get any worse than that. So this is the worst that could happen to us. Yes, this is the worst thing that could happen to our club. She said, well, guess what? When you hit rock bottom, the only way is up. So if you think this is the worst, then it's only going to get up from here. Please, give it another chance. So I deleted the email, and I started calling every member of the club, please come to our meeting. <laughs> and the next meeting, we got 10 people. The meeting after, we got 20. And the club kept on growing to the point that we had to split it into two clubs. The club got so successful that out of that club, three of the division directors came out of it. Five district champions came out of it. And, you know, one world champion came out of me. <laughs> However, it wasn't my doing. It was the presidents who came after me. But I always keep asking myself, what would have happened if I sent that email? What would have happened if I didn't get that phone call? I probably wouldn't be here speaking to you today. In 2014, I decided to do the International Speech Contest. So I went online and I watched every world champion, Darren LaCroix, Nance Miller, Jim Key, Ed Tate, and I'm learning the techniques from each one of them. Those guys were my heroes. I idolized all of them. And I wrote the speech, and ladies and gentlemen, oh my God. <coughs> it was a masterpiece. <laughs> the best thing I've ever done in my entire life. As soon as I was done with it, I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> it was so beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. And I thought, this is it. This is my masterpiece. This is what will take me all the way to the top. So I entered the contest. Club level, boom. I won. A level, boom. I won. Division level, boom. I got second place. <laughs> And even though I wasn't competing for the trophy, that loss hurts so much. I remember sitting outside the hall just like this. And I started screaming. <laughs> Not because I lost. A dear friend of mine, his name is Nasir Al Khalid. May he rest in peace. He came up to me and he said, Muhammad, you did a fantastic job. Everybody loved your speech today. He said, Najib, this is my best work. This is my best work, and my best is still not good enough. Then am I wasting my time? Have you ever had that feeling before? Yes. You do something and you think this is the best thing that I could do, and still your best is not good enough. And you wonder, I just wasted years because 
Clearly, this is not the place for me. If my best wouldn't work. And he said something to me. He said, Muhammad, when you think that you hit your best, that's when you stop trying. That's when you stop living. That's when you just give up. So always convince yourself and tell yourself, my best is yet to come. Even if you do something extraordinary, and people come to you and say, you did a fantastic job, tell them, hey, I have something better. I don't know when, but I have something better. <laughs> always tell yourself, my best is yet to come. Because when you tell yourself, I can do better than this, you will. God knows when, but you will. But when you think this is the best that you can do, you <coughs> just go and die. And all. So always tell yourself this, my best is yet to come. What do you guys think I should do? Keep on. Keep on. Keep on. <laughs> there you go. 2015, I did the International Speech Contest and the Human Speech Contest. And for the first time ever, I make it all the way to the district level. In the Humorous, I won the Humorous Championship. In the International, I came in second place. But it didn't hurt. You know, second best speaker in Saudi Arabia, that's, uh, that's not bad. <laughs> Then two weeks before the finals that's supposed to be taking place in Las Vegas, Nevada, I get a phone call from this guy. His name is Abdullah Jurof. He's our district champion 2015. He calls me and said, uh, Muhammad is Abdullah Jurof. I said, okay, if you just call him to gloat, please, that's, that's not cool. You know? He said, no, I want to ask you, do you have a visa to the US? Yeah. Well, the thing is, my dad is a bit sick. And uh-huh. <laughs> and since I'm the oldest child, I feel like I should be by his side. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to drop my name. You take my place. Two weeks. And I have to go up with two speeches. I don't have this. I cannot do this. And I don't want to go there and make a fool out of myself. So I said, can you give me some time to think about it? He said, we don't have time. T.I., the they're waiting for the name. So I said, just 24 hours. All right, fine. It happened that on the same day, my North Park Club meeting was taking place. And I go to the meeting, and I'm sitting in the back of the hall, and I'm just thinking about the phone call. And after the meeting, my club, my club president, Fatim, she came to me, and she said, uh, Muhammad, you, you seem distracted. Is everything OK? So I told her about the phone call, and that they want me to, to take, to, I mean, to, to, to take his place, and I only have two weeks. I don't think I'm ready. I think I'm going to also say no. Because I don't want to go there and make a fool out of myself. She said, Some chances come only once in your life. And if you don't grab those chances, God knows it might not even come back again. And when these chances come, you might tell yourself, I'm not ready, but guess what? Say yes. Figure out a way to do it later, but say yes. So she said to me, say yes. We'll help you. I said, we only have two weeks. I said, just say yes. We will do whatever it takes. We will help you. So I said, yes. And we all worked in two speeches, and I was rehearsing them every single day until I hated both of them. <laughs> and then I go to Las Vegas. They do the draw, I'm in group number three, and I entered with no expectations at all. I did a speech for my semifinals called Change Your Seat. Uh, Change Your Seat. <laughs> Change Your Seat. And they announced the winners, and boom, I won. And now I'm in the finals. Oh my god. This is real. <laughs> and when you get close to that little piece of glass, Sometimes you might forget why you're here, because it's like, it's right there. <laughs> I can smell it. <laughs> and you forget your true mission in life or what you are there for. Uh. Now, so we go there and they do the draw. I'm the last speaker to take the stage, which is good and bad at the same time. Good because, you know, the grand finale. Bad is, you get to see everybody before you. <laughs> so they take us in this back room behind the stage. 
a round table and all 10 of us sitting at the table. Everybody's nervous. Everybody's wishing I'm just really good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and the first speaker took the stage and oh my God, he was phenomenal. <laughs> Every movement is done well, every word is articulated in the right place, the tone of voice is impeccable, and I looked and thought, okay, maybe I'll get second place. <laughs> the second speaker comes in and he does even better. Okay, maybe third place. <laughs> and every speaker took the stage was much better than the guy before. And that's when I stopped. And I said, hey, Guess what? You're not gonna do this. <laughs> so let's remember why you're here. You have a message that you truly believe in. And you have an audience waiting. Give that message and leave. You're not gonna win. Just do your best, give that message and leave. My turn comes and I'm standing at the back of the stage and there's a lady who opens the curtain for you. So I'm standing there and I asked her, uh, how many people in the audience? <laughs> she goes, 3,500 people. How many of you have seen my speech on YouTube? Go back and watch it again and see what happens right, before, right when I took the stage. When I stood there and I saw everybody, I smiled. Because my target was 1,000, and now I've got three times as much. <laughs> At that moment, ladies and gentlemen, before I even spoke, I realized my dream is true. If I win, fine. If I don't, I honestly don't care. So I pulled that cigarette. <laughs> and I started speaking. And the energy that hits me was unmatchable. I did great, I loved the audience, the audience loved me, I stepped down, and even in my mind, I still believed I'm not gonna win this. But I was happy with my performance. They sat us on the front row. They start announcing the winners. And everybody was just nervous. <laughs> and I'm the only one just playing on my phone. Just I'm gonna win this. <laughs> Third place, second place, and now the world champion of public speaking, 2015, Muhammad Katani. To be honest with you guys, I didn't even hear my name. Because <laughs> I was still playing. <laughs> Until the guy behind me punched me in my back. Dude, go! <laughs> Where? It's you! Huh? Yes, it's you! Look at I walked into that stage and they handed me that giant piece of glass. And they said, would you like to say a few words? And I stood at that podium and I said the exact same acceptance speech that I wrote five years ago. I said, ladies and gentlemen, if you ask anybody who knows me, the person who grew up stuttering, and I still stutter this day, by the way. If you ask anybody who knows me, this is impossible. I shouldn't get this. A man who's born with speech problems can become the best speaker in the world. I don't say you're bragging, I'm just telling you. This proves that impossible doesn't exist. It simply doesn't exist. So look back into your hopes and dreams that somebody killed by saying, this is way out of your league. This is way too much for you. This is impossible. And tell yourself, if this guy can do this, that I can do anything. I took my trophy and they walked me off the stage. As soon as I stepped outside, <coughs> five TV channels and two newspapers just waiting there just to have an interview with me. Flashlights, mics, and everybody's asking me, Mr. Katani, what's next? <laughs> <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> Wait, I don't know. I don't know what's next. Because I didn't think it this way through. I didn't think about going to get here. But now when you get there, the question lingers in your mind. What's next? They walked me through this huge hallway to, to this other room. And during the entire walk, I kept on thinking about that question. What's next? And I didn't have an answer. 
When they walked into that hall, there was a banner, and in front of it, all the world champions. You know, the people that I was watching on YouTube. The people that I idealized, my heroes, and now they're just, you know, colleagues. <laughs> And I stood in front of him and they took this photo. And I thought to myself, you know, they always say it's better to quit when you are top of the game. And now I got to the top of the game. And I, I don't have anything next. So maybe this is the time for me to quit. What do you guys think? <laughs> but I have nothing. But before I quit, which by the way, this is what I thought I would do. I thought to myself, hey, let me just enjoy it a little bit. <laughs> they brought in a table and they put my trophy on top of it. And in front of it is a line of people. The 3,000 people who were in the audience, everybody lined up just to have a picture or have me sign an autograph. Boy, I felt like a million bucks. <laughs> And I started thinking about, you know, the money and the fame and the ladies. And, <laughs> and for a minute there, you forget why you were here. And during this line, like an hour later, a lady came in with tears in her eyes. She came in and she held my hand. And she said, son, I don't want a photo. I don't want an autograph. I waited in this line for a whole hour just to tell you this. What you said up there will make me a better person. I'll be a better person just because of something that you said. I just wanted to come here and say thank you. And then she walked off. And I know this might be hard to believe, but at that moment, that trophy meant nothing. The title meant nothing. All of it meant nothing. Now I know what's next. Ladies and gentlemen, what's next for me is I want in five or ten or twenty years from now, I want to be home, watching TV, <laughs> flipping through the channels. And while I'm flipping through the channels, I see an interview with a successful person an influential person, a person who made a change in his life or her life and the life of others. Hopefully this person is one of you. And they would ask that person, how did it all begin? What was the spark that started you? I, and I want to hear that person say, well, years and years ago, I listened to a guy, his name is Muhammad Sanda. <laughs> And he changed my life. One person. Let me ask you this question. Is this person in this room today? Yes. I can't hear you. Is this person in this room yes. today? Yes. Let's prove it. I'm going to take a picture with you again. <laughs> and whoever you are, once you make it, look me up. Hopefully I'm alive right now. <laughs> look me up. Find this photo. And say thank you, Mom. You know something? A lot of people keep asking me, Mr. Katani, you're an inspiration to the entire world. You know this speech, you, you're so inspiring. And I always say, inspiring? What did I do? It's only a five to seven minute speech and 12 judges kind of thought it was the best speech that day. How many distinguished first masters here in the room today? Would you please stand up? Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what DTM means? <laughs> Distinguished Toastmasters. It means you've done everything in the communication track. And you've done everything in the leadership track. You've done it all. You've done it. Go home. 
Why are you still here? Go home. But I tell you why they don't go home. Because those are the people who do not think what's in it for me, but rather think what's in it for us. They've got the most out of those masses, but they're still here. They still show up, they still serve, serving you guys. So if you're looking for a role model or a hero to follow or an inspiration, the inspiration is not the man on the stage. The inspiration is standing right here. Please give them a big warm applause. You might have joined those classes to be a better speaker. You finish your company communicator and you have that little piece of paper that says you are, you hang it on your wall, and now you know the tricks and trade of speaking, and then you leave. And that's okay. You might have joined first masters to be a better leader. And you get that little piece of paper that says you're a competent leader, you show it to your boss, your boss is impressed, and now you're advancing in your career, you hang it on your wall, and then you leave. And that's still okay. You might have joined Toastmasters just to meet new people. Some people actually got married from Toastmasters. <laughs> and once that happens, you leave. So that's still okay. <laughs> you might have joined Toastmasters to win something. A district champion or a, a world champion or whatever. And once you get that little piece of glass, you leave. And that's still okay. But you could be one of those people who joined who got the most out of it, but stick around because those masses changes your life. Not just as a speaker or a leader, but as a human being. And you see the benefits of all, everything that you learned, and you think, it's a shame for me to keep these benefits to myself. I'm gonna stick around to make sure that other people get it. Because ladies and gentlemen, one day, you will die. One day you will leave this earth. Ask yourself this question, did you leave it a better place just because you were in it? And if you didn't, I'm sorry. <coughs> what kind of life is this? What's the difference between you and an animal? When that day comes and you leave this planet, there might be three types of responses. People might say, oh, thank God he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> or they might say, <laughs> or they might say, oh, no. <laughs> Are you going to get them? Oh, no. <laughs> I really hope that you do. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah.